Hey guys, John Paul Lemmy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, November 26th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. This is for informational purposes only. I am not a financial planner. I cannot give you individual investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So I'm still a little bit under the weather. I had the flu this week. Uh, this is why I hate traveling nowadays, especially like in uh, the flu and cold season. You know, you're going through these airports and there's like all these people out there that know that they're sick and they're traveling anyways because they bought their ticket and they don't want to lose their money. So they're trying to act like they're not sick, but they're hacking and coughing and sneezing. Plus, you know, who, wiping their nose with their hand. And, you know, it's just, it's totally gross. The planes are not clean properly. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not a germaphobe, but this is kind of what's happened the last few times I've traveled. Maybe I have a week in, you know, I take vitamin C, I take vitamin D, you know, I, regardless, you know, I still seem to pick up these bugs. So if my voice is a little bit off or uh, cough or sneeze during this, uh, please forgive me, but uh, that's kind of what happens, right? It's uh, totally how it is. All right, so, you know, the oil market got smashed over the last couple of weeks. And of course, that leads to uh, consternation and people getting upset and what should I do? Uh, especially if you have just entered into these markets And then you get rug pulled on the price. And so, of course, on Clown World Business News, they have to bring an expert in to tell you what happened because everything needs an ex every zig and zag on the chart needs a explanation because they have to keep talking so that they can get, you know, advertisers. I don't, I don't get into that game. You know, if you've been listening to these this video series, uh, channel for a while, you know what the thesis is that we have here for energy. Okay, we're going to be in a decade-long energy crisis. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And inside of that secular bull market that we're in, we're going to have periods of volatility. We've talked about that. So what, you know, this is what I focus on. I focus on the real data. And the fact of the matter is, is the underinvestments leading to drawdowns and in inventories, and it's not reversing. And every time that the price zigs or zags, I go back and look at these types of charts. Now, one of the things that we have to be careful of is confirmation bias. And what do I mean by that? That's just, you know, are we just seeking out information or sources of information or whatever to confirm our bias or confirm what we want to happen. You know, the market doesn't care that I want money. The market doesn't care if you need a return or if you're trying to create wealth. It doesn't care, okay? It doesn't care what you want. And so what I try to do is, this is where the emotion comes in. We've talked about this before, right? Can you control your emotions? Go back to, have you written down why you're in the energy market, why you bought certain stocks, okay? And the reason that I buy these stocks is because I believe we're in an energy crisis because of under, chronic undersupply in a market that has, you know, long-term growth. Uh, we know the history of growth for energy, particularly hydrocarbons, goes up one to one and a half percent a year. We know what's happening in the emerging markets doesn't matter what happened last week. That's not going to change that, okay? Uh, the fact that companies are underinvesting does not get changed in one week. And so we've talked about this before. This is not the first time this has happened to us. We don't worry about week-to-week -week zigs and zags, okay? And is the thesis still, you know, did all of a sudden all the companies in the world decide that they're going to go out and start drilling and creating more? No, that's not happened. And so the other argument would be like, well, John, we're going to have a recession. Well, we're going to have a discussion about that here too, okay? Even during recessions, there's only been like four to, over the last 50 to 60 years, there's only been like four or five cases where worldwide demand for petroleum has went down, 
Okay, and they were extreme cases, like the great financial crisis, the thing that we just had, the, the you know, pandemic lockdowns, things like that. Typically, you know, even in the rest of the world, petroleum demand continues to increase. I mean, we've talked about the numbers in India. They're, go, they're off the chart, right? Yes, you know, China is a, is a, is a, is a lead weight. It's, we're dragging this behind the boat, <clears throat> slowing us down. But that's eventually going to turn too. It has to. They're not just going to keep the country of China in lockdown forever. It's simply, I guess anything's possible, but it seems inconceivable to me. So, uh, yeah, as long as the draws continue, then we stay bullish. You know, we're, we're seeing Europe entering recession, if it's not already in recession. The U.S. is probably heading for a recession. But what happens during times of recession? Okay, the monetary uh, scheme will go from being tight to being loosened. And so then we'll go through another cycle of, you know, money creation. I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole thing. You, you, you guys know the trick. So don't worry about the week to week. Do you understand the long term fact that we're in an energy crisis? That's why you should be investing in energy companies, not because you heard somebody on the Internet say something about it. If you don't have an understanding of why you're in these companies, then you're not going, do you have an, you know, people are talking about, everybody's getting into oil field services stocks. I was talking about them 18 months ago, two years ago, when nobody cared about it, when we were told that the demand for petroleum was in long-term decline. Now there's a lot of people talking about oil field services. They, a lot of them have already moved quite a bit. It doesn't mean there's more, not more out there, but you know, this is how we make our real money is going to places where no one else wants to go, understanding a trend before it gets mainstream and then getting positioned and then waiting for the mainstream to come to us Just, and discover you know, the fact that there's been tremendous underinvestment for the last 10 years in the oil fields, in oil field uh, new development. This is, this is a new revelation all of a sudden. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm not worried about it. Uh, I know what's going to happen. Can, can oil drop into the 60s or 50s? Why couldn't it? Absolutely. Why not? Uh, in the short term, sediment and liquidity drives markets. In the long term, the fundamentals drive it. So I'm not worried. Uh, that, that's just the only thing I want to say about it. So the other big situation is you're getting a lot of negative news out of China, perceived negative news about another delay in reopening. That, that's how markets taking it. With an explosion in new cases of the COOF. and here's a chart. Here's a, some a graphic. I find it interesting. I think that you know the Chinese are going to open up their economy. Uh, I think they recognize the damage. I mean, are they going to keep this economy locked down over the sniffles forever? I mean, I think I've explained this before. You know, the Chinese went full bore on this thing. Xi Jinping personally, you know put some pro prestige into this, his name on it. It's his policy. It's the CCP's policy. It's war against COVID, blah, blah, blah. This, you know, Communist Party, they're going to save everyone. And so the economy has suffered. They know that. So now the party Congress has ended. Um, and all of a sudden you see like cases are exploding, right? And so you are seeing, you know, lockdowns, number of cities with daily local new cases. And so what I think you're going to see is uh, what we've seen in the West. This is going to be allowed to go up. Yes, you're seeing, well, John, what about, I saw a thing on Twitter and they were building 80,000 units in a cells in a quarantine camp. Yes, they're going to do that. You think they're going to build 1.2 billion cells and put everybody in them? Okay, you're going to see the propaganda and the PR ramp up that the state's doing something the state's following it's what it's doing but did you also see the riots that are happening where the police are being you know people are throwing you know wood and stuff at the police people have had enough of this okay and i think the government's had enough of it and so everything's passed the party congress has ended uh you know we're into the sniffle stages of this thing right now uh where it's not as bad as it was originally i think everybody can at least agree on that and so what I think will be allowed to happen is this thing ripped through the population. Uh, they'll continue to, you know, posture that they're, you know, isolating people and 
QR coding people and all these things. But I think if this COOF follows the uh, trajectory that it has followed in the West, it will accelerate like it's now doing. It will eventually, uh, you know, a lot of people have already had this probably there also, right? This thing will probably peak and then come back down. And when it rolls over, and it's obvious it's rolled over this wave. Then I think the CCP will declare victory. And then you'll see uh, the economy be opened up in stages. So that's what I'm anticipating. It's not going to happen over the next two weeks. It'll take several, probably several months, probably into the first quarter of next year. But, uh, you know, that would be very positive to our energy uh, thesis because right now with China in its current situation, dealing with this or trying to deal with it in their way, it's leading to about two, and a two, two to two and a half million barrels of demand off the market. So we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they will stay locked down forever over the sniffles. I don't know. Uh, I doubt it, but uh, anything's possible. But I think that we're probably, you know, they want to do this in a way that they open the thing, but they position themselves as, look what we did. Look what the CCP did. We saved us. You know, we followed this and, you know, so that it's not just going to be in a one day, you know, we reopen. It's going to be over stages. You're going to see the propaganda. You know, we're still isolating people. We still have the QR codes, but you see that all this worked. We did, you know, we said we would do it. We did it. This is the triumph of the people's uh, leaders over, you know, this West didn't follow this and we did look how, how we've come out of it stronger and better. It'll be something like that. I'll, jazzed up in propaganda. But anyways, this is what I anticipate. So we'll see. I mean, if 2 million barrels of demand comes back for in Chinese internal demand, uh, yeah, you're going to have, a, and then the SPR goes away, there's your three, three and a half million barrels. I mean, that's, that's how you get over $100 a barrel pretty quick. And like I said, that's with the US probably, possibly at least having economic slowdown in some sectors with Europe in recession. So what happens when these things reverse, which inevitably they do, there simply isn't enough energy. So this is what I want to talk about. Like uh, reminds me of the Bob Farrell, you know, if you've got my ebook that you can get uh, from becoming a, you know, getting on my e email list, you get it for free and go over uh, one of the all time great market, guys, Bob Farrell, this is one of the things he said, his 10, I don't want to say commandments, but 10 axioms, wise statements says, when all experts agree, something else tends to happen. And so what we have here is this uh, probability of recession over the coming 12 months in the Fed survey of professional forecasters. Well, you know, don't put a lot of stock in what the professional forecasters say, but right now, you, this goes back to 1968. This is like the most anticipated recession ever. And so if everybody's anticipating recession, yeah, uh, there's many times when the crowd does get it right, but you have to be suspicious when all the experts are on one side of the canoe. We've talked about that before. I thought this was very interesting because this doesn't just go back like two or three years. This goes back to 1968. And this is really an outlier. I mean, are things really that bad here in the U.S.? This is the worst. I mean, I lived through the GFC, the tech wreck, uh, the 80, 80s, early 80s, late 70s recessions when I was a kid. I, I don't remember this. This isn't as bad in my mind. That doesn't mean it can't get worse, the economy. But are we closer to the beginning of rate increases or are we closer to the end of rate increases? And what happens when the Fed pauses and reverses course, which inevitably will happen. So this is something to contemplate. Uh, if you didn't have that, if you don't have that book, it's pretty good. It's an ebook. It goes over, like I said, Bob Farrell's like 10 axioms. And they're like pretty wise statements like this, you know. So uh, anyways, if you're interested in that, you can go into the show notes. And if you click on the link, you subscribe to be, get on my mailing list where I, well, I haven't been putting out a lot of information lately, but I typically would send out a weekly email on some 
uh, topic that was uh, current, that was actionable, uh, and many people found it uh, useful. So anyway, I just wanted to point this out because this is really an outlier compared to like the last 50 years. So I think we've showed this before, but uh, you know, I'm big on this energy return on investment. And what does that mean? You know, if you build an energy producing facility, it requires a certain amount of energy to get the materials, process them into the solar panels, the combined cycle gas turbine, the power plant equipment, ship it, assemble it, get it up and running. So you have this, you know, what's the energy return on energy invested? And again, you know, when you see this seven here, this is uh, what I've seen from several people that talk about energy return on energy investment. That seven is typically the threshold that you want to be at where you can have like civilization or economic, they call it economically viable threshold or where you're producing enough energy on the energy invested that you can continue to move forward with your civilization. Anything below that and you're basically stagnant. You know, we've talked about that before. It's fascinated me during medieval times. I read that book where the energy return on energy invested was like two or three to one because people were reliant on their crop yields or their fodder, you know, grass and hay that they were able to produce to feed their draft animals, their work animals, and enough food to feed themselves. And that's why, you know, there was no accumulated wealth. You know, when you can, when you can produce energy at these levels, you have a surplus of energy. That surplus of energy allows you to accumulate the wealth that allows you to do like, you know, research and development, you know, build things, uh, have the arts, all these things that are not necessarily required for survival. All this excess wealth is there to allow for all of these other endeavors. And you can see that, uh, you know, people will argue with this, of course, they can argue all they want. It's interesting that wind is, you know, fairly high uh, without storage. Uh, at 16, so it's above the economically viable threshold, but why mess around with it when nuclear is 75? I mean, this is where the world is going to move over the decades. It's not, the future's not down here, guys. The future's over here. There's no reason to invest money and time into this when this is available, okay? And this is why hydro is so popular. Look at the returns on hydro, but again, how many rivers can you dam? All of the rivers that are viable pretty much have been dammed up and used for this. So you see, this is the reason why we use hydrocarbons. It's not because we're greedy or we want to destroy the earth. It's because they have a high EROI, plus they're, they were very easy to produce, transport, and uh, use. And this is why we did that. But this is the future in my mind. And I think that regardless of all of the nonsense we're going through now, like I said, the realization is going to hit and this is where we're going to end up because you could do so many other things with this excess energy there. I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but um, if you want to have a hydrogen economy, if you want to do desalination around desert areas, whatever you want to do, this is such a tremendous windfall of energy returned on energy invested in a nuclear. Uh, it, it's just cannot be, uh, you know, is this... you? With solar PV currently, you can't even, you, you're regressing. You're actually uh, losing long-term and, uh, you know, you cannot maintain civilization with a four return when it requires seven. But they're going to try it anyway. So like I said, heads we win, tails we win more. But this is the kind of interesting. Now people say, well, where did this chart come from? Who, co who compiled it? What were the assumptions made? Look, guys. There's plenty of information out there. Charles Hall, I've talked about it. He was the guy that came up with the concept of energy return on investment. I've put a link to the book before and previous. You can read it yourself. You can argue with him, okay? Uh, but that's, I'm convinced of it. Uh, I've been, from what I've seen from my own experiences in the energy industry, uh, in the power of steam and, you know, nuclear power in, when I was in the Navy and just the coal and thermal plants that I've been around uh, and then what I've seen, you know, down here on this end, there's no comparison. So that's my view and uh, I'm sticking to it. And that's where my 
uh, thesis. That's where my money's going. So we'll see. We'll see who's right in the end. So this was a uh, conference that they had. I'm going to put a link to the guy. Uh, it's a guy I follow on Twitter. As far as tankers, this guy is like totally talking about tankers. He puts a lot of information out. Uh, if you're on Twitter, I suggest, and you're interested in tank the tanker market, whether it's uh, crude tankers or product tankers, I suggest you follow him. But they had this this market outlook, and I just wanted to, I'll put a link to the thread because he goes through the slides, and uh, it's a long thread. It's like 20, you know, tweets, but it's worth uh, taking a look at if you're interested. I just want to show, like, one of the tweets, a couple of the tweets. Um, you know, I did not understand this. I knew that in the U.S. we had, I thought we had shut down like 5% of our uh, refining capacity. This is the percentage of refining capacity closed since January 2020 when we had the maximum coup, remember? And, you know, once you shut down these refineries, you typically are not going to reopen them, right? Because you can't just have this equipment just sitting there, uh, not doing anything, not in cold iron, what we call cold iron, just sitting there, you know, you have rotating machinery, you have problems where if you don't rotate the machinery, then you get problems with the bearings. It's just the weights. It's on a certain one section of the bearing. All kinds of other things happen. I mean, you, you, these things are designed to start up, run, and, ne and never stop running. So once you shut them down, they typically don't restart. But look at the refining capacity around the world that shut down this domestic percent of domestic capacity, like in Belgium, 17%. Finland, 22%. 31% of the refining capacity in the UK has been taken offline since January 2020. This is amazing. I didn't realize this. So this is another uh, situation here where you have the east first west of Suez refining capacity changes. So as we've talked about before, why are we bullish on clean tankers? Well, the demand for the refined products didn't go away. You know, after the coup went away, the pandemic subsided and we've reopened that demand for de diesel, gasoline, jet fuel, what, it, what have you, is still there, or it's come back. And it, you basically have shut down most of the, a lot of the refining capacity in the West, Germany, 7%, Canada. And so the demand's still there. And so the refinery, most of the refining capacity that has come online or expanded has been east of the Suez Canal, right? Places like India, the Middle East, China. And so the trips that you used to have, if you were refining and getting your diesel from a, from a refinery in the UK and 31% of the, of the um, refining capacity in the UK went away in the last two years, the demand for diesel and jet fuel did not go down 31%. So now you have to bring it from somewhere else. Well, we'll just bring it from Belgium. Well, their refining capacity went down. Or we'll bring it from you know, Portugal or Norway, all the, all these places are shutting down their refining capacity. Or we used to get it from Russia, okay? They would come out of the Baltic and just short trip through the Baltic and into the North Sea and then into the UK. But that's, you know, been changed now because of the sanctions. And so now the reason why you have this tremendous run in these clean tanker stocks is, or one of the reasons is the fact that because the refining capacity is so far away now from the end user, that you still have the same amount of tankers. There's virtually been no growth in new new tankers because you can't just flip a switch like you can with these refiners. They flipped a switch and turned them off. Uh, and yet you can't just increase the tanker fleet to compensate. So the trips are taking longer, okay? Uh, and with the same amount of tankers, so it's a supply and demand situation. That's why you've seen rates explode and why we're in a tanker bull market, or one of the reasons why. It's not the only reason, but it's a pretty significant. But I didn't realize um, until I saw this really how much of the refining capacity had actually been taken offline since the uh, pandemic. And uh, most of this will not restart. I mean, look at this in South Africa, for example, 58% of refining capacity closed since January 2020. Now, I don't, maybe some of these restarted, I don't know. Uh, it's very possible, but I think you get the gist of what we're talking about. This, if nothing else, tells you exactly what's happening, right? Um, East-West refining capacity changes. So the demand in the West is basically back to pre-pandemic levels, 
and yet the ability to meet that demand internally is not there. And so now you have to bring things from further away. No growth in the tanker fleet, higher rates. And so here we go in Germany. I mean, uh, like I said, I put these on here, not necessarily to like dunk or uh, on these particular governments, but I want to re-emphasize re and just show you that let's be, co let's be completely honest, okay? Um, the energy crisis in Europe is self-inflicted, okay? At any time, they can break away from the U.S. hegemon and say, we're going to have a reproachment with Russia. And Russia, I think, would, you know, work towards that with them, okay, independently. They don't want to do that. Again, I saw Annalena Baerbock, again, giving another speech recently. She said that people in Europe are prepared for two or three years of hardship to, you know, help out with this war in Ukraine. Okay, well, we'll see. And so what has happened is, is that doesn't change the fundamentals on the ground, that you've cut off your major supplier of energy. So of course you have an energy crisis. So this is a government created energy crisis. This is a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And so instead of taking the gun away or getting rid of these people and, and these, these ridiculous people, uh, they're, they're in power still. And they can, t so they're going to put band-aids on top of band-aids, right? So this is what we're going to do because energy prices go up, which they will go up in a situation where you artificially constrict the supply. This is their natural reaction. Then they come up with all these, uh, goofball methods of trying to solve the problem. And here's the newest one. It's going to, Germany's going to set a windfall of 90%, windfall taxes of 90% on some clean energy producers. Again, any taxes or windfalls, profit taxes or whatever, are disincentives to creating more supply. Uh, it's just economics 101 unless the government's going to get in there and mandate that. So then you just have a command and control economy, which does not work. You might as well Sovietize the entire com the economy, and that will not work either. So we'll see. It says Germany has set out its plan to claw back 90% of the earnings from some clean power generators as the government seeks funding for its consumer aid package. So you've cut down the supply, and now the government's going to subsidize people's, or try to subsidize people's energy usage. I mean, you just see how like this is really like not a good idea. This is just not working well, okay? The government is planning to skim earnings above $130 a megawatt hour for solar, wind, and nuclear, according to a draft law seen by Bloomberg News. Politicians are trying to reclaim some of the profits that companies like RWE are making from high power prices. Yeah, that the government created by the by shutting off the their major energy supplier. Again, I'm not going to make a moral judgment. Uh, evidently, the uh, uh, the people that are currently in charge in Europe feel like this is a moral imperative, but the only people that are really suffering are the people in Europe. It's not having the intended, you know, uh, it's not really working like they thought. And so again, they're not going to off ramp or they're not going to, as they continue to take torpedoes under the waterline, they don't seem to understand. I mean, this is not a sophisticated political class, these greens, okay? They're naive, they're true believers. Uh, and when you're a true believer or a fanatic, you're not going to, you know, to, again, you're going to have to literally, the people are going to have to do like Sri Lanka. They're going to have to go into the European Parliament, pull these people out, and do what they need to do. That's the only way this is going to change. They're going to continue taking you down this path. Okay? And, uh, you know, I've seen some interviews. There's this girl, Spanish girl. She goes to, like, Donbass, and she goes around to different countries in Europe, and she interviews people, and people are complacent. They're just like, yeah, everything's fine so far. We're a little worried, but we'll see what happens. And so far, so good. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, talking about the people like in Germany and these other places, some people are nervous, but it really hasn't hit them yet. So we'll see. Maybe it won't hit them. Maybe the government can tightrope this thing and keep everything, you know, under control. Now, it's, it seems to be a little bit different in Eastern Germany, East part of Germany, the former communist part of Germany, 
uh, they're getting a little bit more agitated than the people in West Germany, but we'll see. It says the windfall tax will be applied to electricity producers based on the fuel they use. Lignite plants will be taxed on earnings above $82 a megawatt and oil plants above 280. The measures will apply for 10 months, backdated to start September 2022 until the end of 2023 and could be extended to the end of 2024. Well, we'll see. You know, typically when these things start, they don't usually roll them back, but we'll see what happens. Uh, again, self-inflicted gunshot wound and then trying to put Band-Aids on top of Band-Aids on top of Band-Aids instead of addressing the root cause of the problem. You know, you are economies. I mean, what's I find amusing is a lot of these countries have uh, tremendous potential for their own internal energy development. There are... I'm not saying that's geologically feasible. They tried to develop some shale gas in Poland like 10 or 15 years ago. It didn't go very well. But I do know that they're, you know, like in the UK, they, they have the ability to at least try to develop it. Everybody's against hydraulic fracturing. Okay, so they don't want to do it. Okay. And so what we get is, well, we'll subsidize the population because we know they're getting hot about this. In order to get the money from the sub for the subsidies, we're going to tax the energy producers who need to have a windfall every so often so that they can have excess profits, which draws more capital into that industry. And so, but yet the energy industry is so uh, regulated and so politicized, which, because there's so much money involved and because it's such a hot topic, literally, because people can freeze to death or die of heat exposure or blackouts. This is why the government involves itself. So it's just a situation uh, that could go from bad to worse, we'll see. I, I don't think trying to push the buttons and turn the va this is this is Goss plan all over again. It doesn't work in the long term. So this is the Goring and Rosenzweig quarter three resource commentary. I've talked about these guys before. If you go to their website, uh, they put out a quarterly resource commentary. It's usually about 35, 40 pages long. They go over everything. They usually have a long section, about half of the papers, about some topic that they are talking about. They've been talking a lot about the uh, lack of investment in new oil and gas, uh, the energy crisis. And I just wanted to take a few snippets out of what they've been saying. Uh, this, this particular uh, issue was a little bit shorter because they had a big resource conference, which I believe you can also access uh, the audio on their website. But anyways... Uh, I would suggest you read these guys. Uh, again, be careful of confirmation bias. They run a resource uh, ETF or mutual fund. So they this is what they talk about. And so, um, you know, it's like asking a barber if you need a haircut. So they're going to, you know, be fairly, you know, optimistic, I think, on commodities if anytime you ask them. So anyway, I do think that the information is worth, uh, it's free. So why not? But I thought there were some interesting snippets, which I'll get into here. It says, our models told us that resource depletion problems coupled with massive capital curtailment would make widespread shortages highly likely in the coming years. In the lead essay of our second quarter 2020 letter, we warned of an impending energy crisis, a highly unusual conclusion at the time, given that oil markets had turned negative only one month before. Yeah, and you can go back and read these uh, previous commentaries, and they, they were on, on top of this. After studying the issue in depth, we believe oil companies are acting very rationally, even if it seems counterintuitive. And what they're talking about is, why aren't people going out and drilling? Why aren't people, uh, why aren't companies out, you know, high prices, secure high prices? Why aren't they drilling? And so they get into a, a few issues of why that is. By keeping activity low, oil companies are simply responding to the signals sent from th their three significant constituencies all emphatically telling them not to drill. These constitu constituencies are policymakers, investors, and their internal strategy teams. So the next slide here, we're going to go into a couple. These are the three snippets I took from each section, just to give you a little flavor of what's going on with these three constituencies. This is what we've talked about before. Why aren't companies drilling and why this will exacerbate the uh, energy crisis? Uh, and this, this, I, I think this is tremendous to understand because I, I fully 100% agree with what they say here. 
Uh, despite calls for more production, policymakers remain highly hostile toward the fossil fuel industry. In the United States, President Biden repeatedly floated the idea of a windfall profit tax that would severely impact EMP profitability. Again, we've talked about this ad nauseum. Okay, the administration has no energy policy. Okay, except you know, transition. I guess within the four years of their term of president uh, of President Biden, and uh, you know, you see what we're they're doing everything they can to uh, hinder development of fossil fuels. And yet, on the other side, castigating on the other side of their mouth, castigating and throwing the fossil fuel industry under the bus, telling them to invest more money, or they're going to do, or threatening them. I mean, nobody's going to. And like the, the sections in the in the report go into it more in depth. I'm just giving you like high level snippets here. Again, this is the next thing that we've talked about a lot. Investors are also signaling oil companies to slow development. This claim might sound odd given energy stocks have been one of the few bright spots in the market over the last two years. Since January 1st, 2021, energy exploration and production companies, as measured by the XOP ETF, are up 182% compared with the S&P, which is up a mere 9%. Well, we, we, we've talked about you know what investors want out of these holdings now. They want cash returned to them. They want debt paid down, and then they want the excess cash returned to them. And that's what the... This is the second constituency that these managements are responding to. And then the third group is the internal constituencies of these companies. The last group signaling energy companies to keep development muted are their strategy teams, petroleum engineers, rig crews, and project managers. The reason is resource depletion. We have long argued that Eagle Ford and Bakken producers have drilled out most of their best wells, so production would likely plateau and decline. And so the other thing that they've talked about they being Gordon and Rosenzweig and uh, Josh Young at Bison Interest have talked about this too. You know, OPEC's probably uh, at the top of the most they can produce. So you have these large producers, you know, is U.S. shale peaked? Very possibly. Has OPEC peaked? Very possibly. Has Russia peaked? Very possibly. So where does the new oil come from? Yes, Brazil seems to be ramping up a little bit, Guyana, but this is like, I was listening to a like macro voices episode and a guy was on there. And so Eric Townsend was asking the guy where, you know, we're depleting 6 million barrels a day, uh, a, a, of a day of production a year, just in natural, you know, decline. So you need to find and bring online 6 million barrels. So the guy was like talking about Guyana and well, maybe, you know, Exxon and Hess and these guys will get production up from like 300 and 400,000 barrels up to like a million barrels a day by, um, you know, 2030. And Eric's like, well, where does he, you know, every year you have resource depletion guy. So, and he couldn't really think, well, West Africa, there's some development. I mean, there's no major development going on. We're, we are going to be facing at some point in the relatively near future. And I say the next couple few years, uh, you know, a tremendous increase in the oil price, okay? And uh, do I think that that will bring back sufficient investment? Well, we'll see. But uh, I really suggest you read this because it goes more in depth and I save these things and refer to them. I just, you know, you can, they, you, you have to register, they send you a link, you could get a PDF and then, you know, you just leisurely read through this and make notes. But these guys have been fairly accurate uh, in their calls. Uh, and, uh, again, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a lot of the things we've already been, we've been talking about here over time. You know, this is the, uh, these, I like how they kind of put it into these three constituencies are right. We've talked about, you know, what's going on with the government policy with investors and, uh, internally at the oil companies. So, uh, this is, this is really, really good stuff. And so this kind of shows you, right. You know, high prices, cure high prices. This goes back to 2008. Typically, when you see a large increase in the oil price or steady, you know, we see oil above $100 a barrel for several years, you know, the rig count, rigs, you know, increased working rigs uh, to bring more production on. But then, you know, same thing, price drops, rig count goes down, that responds, but it's not really responding like it has in the past. There's this big gap opening up now. So I guess maybe, you know, the situation would be like the oil price is going to crash 
or these three components that we just talked about are, you know, stifling the new development. I suggest it's the latter. So I wanted to throw this in there. You know, everybody knows I'm a big fan of Uzbekistan. You know, the economy, uh, it was kind of interesting. Uzbekistan really didn't lock down super hard during the COVID thing. And the economy really kind of just kept chugging along at, you know, five, four, five, six percent a year. And they're really making a lot of these changes uh, that have been very positive. And uh, obviously, because it's an emerging market, it's not, you know, performed as well recently because of the strong dollar, some other things. But I remain long term bullish on the place uh, as it continues to make the reforms it's making. You know, the, the growth is going to compound over time, five, six percent GDP. And that will have a tremendous effect on the companies operating there and the wealth creation that's going on in the country. I mean, Uzbekistan's tremendously uh, uh, endowed with a lot of resources now that are very high in demand, i.e. copper, um, gas, natural gas, uh, and uranium. And so this is a recent article I found. It was pretty interesting. So you get it like a two for here, the two things that I'm kind of bullish on. It says Uzbekistan announces its intention to become a global leader in uranium mining. Now, I lost the article because I had to empty my cash. I would like to put a, art, a link to it because it was a really long article. It was pretty good, well-researched. It talked about how they're going to get from their current production to where they want to go by 2030. It says Uzbekistan is going to double its uranium production to 7,100 tons by 2030. To achieve this ambitious goal, the country has already allowed its public company to publish statistical data about uranium reserves and output with no limitations. Uzbekistan is ranked fifth among large uranium producers, falling behind Kazakhstan, Namibia, Canada, and Australia. So I think they're like right around 4,000 tons a year uh, or a little bit less. Well, they want to double, so it's like 3,500 tons. So it's not an insignificant producer, but going to... Uh, 7,000, if the rest of these places don't grow, then, uh, you know, it could, it could go to being the number two producer. So we'll see. Um, you know, people have become soured on uranium. I still think that we're at the beginning of a bull market. Um, like I said, the demand for uranium is going to increase over time. And again, people say, well, you know, if you listen to like with Cameco saying and some of their conference calls. I mean, they're signing long-term contracts. They wouldn't, they're not stupid. They're not signing long-term contracts to bring these mines back online like MacArthur River and lose money. So I think you have to be patient. Again, if you're in the juniors, you know, you, you uh, I've said this before, there's probably only two investable uh, uranium stocks and that's Kaz, Adam, Prom and, and Cameco. They actually have sales and earnings. If the company you own is doesn't have sales of uranium or earnings, then you're speculating. You're speculating on a higher uranium price or you're speculating on a takeover or something like that because they have no revenue, okay? And so if they have no revenue, they still have costs. And we've talked about this before. So people become discouraged because why isn't the price of my stock moving? You said that the uranium, yes, I did say, that doesn't mean that it's in investable. There's only two investable companies. The rest are speculations, they're burning matches. Go light a wooden match and hold it. It's a burning match. That is what your company is. And if you hold it too long, or if you're in the wrong part of the cycle, then you're going to get burned, okay? It's going to eventually burn down. That's what they do. They burn capital, okay? Those are the facts, guys. Most of the uranium companies that people are holding are not going, they're speculations. You're hoping, you're speculating that we get a run in the uranium price and a a tide comes in and lifts all boats. Otherwise, you should just probably be in the uranium ETF, which is mostly suited, mostly holding, it's its top holdings, Kaz, Adam, Prom, Cameco, and the uh, uranium trusts, okay, that hold physical uranium. That's just how it is. So, um, but, you know, you can get, uh, this is a way to play it also and play the commodity boom over the rest of this decade. Uzbekistan, uh, like I've said before, is a tremendous place to uh, invest, in my opinion. Is it, it's not Singapore. So, you know, uh, anything can happen there that, you know, we had some political situation there a few months ago, but it calmed down. Uh, but, you know, they're moving in the right direction. And all the indications are for me that 
They're going to keep proceeding with their economic reforms. In the history of countries that pursue free market economic reforms, uh, especially coming out of to almost like several years ago of like almost a pseudo North Korea situation. I mean, there was a time even up till recently, like a year or so ago, or maybe even more recent than that, you know, where you were forced to go into the fields and pick cotton. You know, here in Texas, we don't pick cotton by hand. We have machines that do that. But this place is so capital starved. They used to have this time where people would go into the fields as their patriotic duty and pick cotton. Okay, this is a tremendous uh, cotton growing country. But, you know, these things are changing now because uh, as the country opens up, as the country reforms, as the country uh, has capital come in, you don't need to send college students and people out in the summertime in the heat to pick cotton so by hand uh but that's just an example so uh we expect more of the country to uh open up the reforms are going to see several state-owned enterprises are going to list shares publicly and i think that uh as you know like i said this thing grew right through the pandemic and uh didn't go super crazy on lockdowns and things like that Plus, it's, it's now being recognized as one of the top tourist places in the world. So you're going to, it just really has a lot of things going for it, it has a lot of tailwinds. So uh, this is just another one in my view. So I want to finish up here with a couple of things that most people don't like talking about, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. The average investor buys high and sells low. Uh, this is, if you've seen my marketing materials, I talk about this as why investors stink at uh, investing their own money. Again, I'm going to say this again, even though it's not helpful for selling newsletter subscriptions and it bruises some people's egos. Most of the people listening to this should not be investing their own money. You're not good at it. It's just that simple. And uh, you shouldn't be doing it. What you should do is focus on your career and increasing your ability to earn money and then put money into a tax advantage account. I an IRA or a uh, 401k, something like this, and buy the cheapest S&P 500 fund or world index fund that you can find and just put money into it year after year and forget about it. Don't try to pick individual stocks. Most people are not good at it. They can't do it. Uh, and then you shouldn't buy and sell these mutual funds or ETFs that you get into uh, inside your IRA or 401k. Just put the same money in. Don't even look at it. That's what most people should do. Okay, now the financial industry doesn't want to tell you that because then they don't get the fees and the commissions that they get from people trading all the time. But this is the historical truth for most for most people. Um, and so here we go. You know, average return of the S and P five hundred is twelve percent. I'm sure that's with dividends reinvested. Average return of stock mutual funds nine percent. That's because of fees and the fact that active uh, investors, even professionals underperform the market averages over the long term. And the average return of holders of these funds, 4%. Why? Because they try to trade. Okay, they get caught up. Well, they said there's going to be a recession, I should sell my stocks. They said there's going to be a boom, I'm going to buy stocks. And so if you're following clown world financial news, which is most people is what they're following, okay, um, you're going to get all emotionally revved up to buy high and sell low, okay? Or when you're at Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas and your goofy brother-in-law is there bragging about some biotech stock and you're thinking to yourself, this guy's a moron. He's wearing the pants from one jacket and the, uh, or pants from one, one suit and the jacket from another suit. And you think, well, He's bragging how much money, but why can't I do that? And so you go and open yourself an account and you can trade everything from this phone. It's a video game and makes it easy for you to, you know, allow your emotional state to drive your investment decisions, which lead to people losing money. Again, I'll bring this up. I think it's fascinating that Peter Lynch who's one of the greatest investors of all time. He had one of the greatest runs that was in the time of a historical bull market, but regardless he ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund. And I think I've talked about this before. They did a, somebody did a, I think he did it or Fidelity did it, but a uh, did the research. And the majority of people, even though he had this like compounded 24% a year for like 10 years, okay, or, or longer, 
most of the people in the Fidelity Magellan Fund did not have those returns because what did they do? Average return of holders of these funds. They bought high and sold low. They tried to trade. Most of you are not going to be successful doing that. Stop doing that. You're not going to have success. So I know every time I say this, people get so I get a couple of comments in this. Oh, you know, who are you to tell? Do what you want. It's a free country. I don't care what you do. But I'm just telling you that <laughs> that's for the most people, they should not be trying to time the market. It doesn't work. And so this is the other thing I think that people get caught up in. We just talked about that, you know, all this talk. We talked about it earlier in the earlier in the uh, presentation. And, you know, everybody's, you know, the biggest, most anticipated recession of all time that's supposedly going to hit the U.S. Uh, and the Bob Farrell's wise statement that when everybody agrees on something, most likely something else will happen. You know, and then people think, well, if we're going to have a recession, the stock market, you know, I, I see these people on Twitter, we're going to have a stock market crash on Monday. How, how do they know that? And really, this is the historical frequency of market declines. Now, I'm not going to talk about the center section. This is, came off of another presentation. I don't want to get into this. Just focus on the far left column and the far right column. The historical frequency for a 10% drop is every 11 months. Uh, you know, the historical frequency of a market dropping 50%, which I guess a lot of people think is a crash. I'm talking about the overall market now, not sectors. Two to three times per century, guys. So if you're out there calling chicken little, calling for, you know, the bottom line is, is that what is investing? It's you're buying portions of company and you want to see a company cash flow and reinvest that cash flow in its business, okay? Or reinvest, if it can't get a above market return, then you should probably sell the stock. But regardless, uh, this is the whole basis of investing, finding companies that have relatively good returns on their invested capital, returns on equity, and that they are able to invest those, reinvest those profits in their business and expand over time, okay, and create wealth. That's how, if you look at all successful investors throughout time, that's what it is. Find good companies and sit on your butt. And this is the problem. It just kind of goes back to what I said before. Most people can't do that. And so we're getting to this time in the portfolio where I'm going to start introducing some of these types of companies. I mean, another I've had people lambast me. Why haven't you been putting these companies in before? You claim you have all these good investments. <clears throat> well, they haven't performed because we're in a bear market. Okay, so now I think we're getting to the end of the bear market. There's some tremendous companies. I mean, one of the companies that I own has a tremendous market share in a business it's in. And it's the, the company on the... New York Stock Exchange has been buying back the most of its own stock forever for like the last five or 10 years. So, I mean, things like that. Uh, is it going to go up? Like, but people want, people want the flash, right? They want the pizzazz. Okay. What's that coal stock that's going to go up a thousand percent? Well, those are available out there too, but those don't, that's not investing. That's more speculating. And so we're going to introduce some investing because I'm not going to just like, you know, I don't just, hot run speculations. Uh, the newsletter was set up like that originally because that's what drives people to it. But I'm going to start introducing other things into it. You know, one of the things I have in there is a company that basically has you is invested in the Republic of Georgia and it's just been compounding capital over time. And the share price is tremendously undervalued to the net asset value. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm content to sit there as the Georgian economy goes along at five or 6% a year, compounding, compounding growth over time. And as that uh, particular company takes advantage of that by buying companies inside Georgia that have the ability to ride that wave. And that's kind of my thesis, like on countries like Uzbekistan. And then you have to go look like even in developed markets like we're in is, you know, where are the companies that have consistent growth and uh, are well run? And then you buy a part of that business and let it compound. But, you know, every, calling for chicken little crash, I mean, even a 20% decline only happens every four years. Historically, that doesn't mean that, you know, somebody's going to go and find some small piece where you had two 20% drops in a three-year period and say, well, you're wrong. Look, dude, this is, I'm just telling you, this th th these big 
drawdowns are not as frequent as you think. And when they do happen, you should be buying. This is why Charlie Munger says, if you can't endure a 50% drop two or three times a century, you're not psychologically or emotionally built for investing in the stock market. And if this is the case that you have, you know, even a 40% drop every few decades or whatever, 30% drop every decade, you should be welcoming, welcoming these as opportunities to reload. That's my view. Now, I didn't always know this. And I didn't always, I was, I was always the one to, I was predicting everything. We're going to have a crash. You know, this particular president, economic policies, I don't agree with. We're going to have a crash. Okay, the economy is going to go down the tubes. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of financial doomsday and that for some reason sells, you know, you know, you have the results sitting there. You have the breadcrumbs, you have the trail signs for all of these wealthy investors that are freely telling you to the same thing I'm telling you right now. And yet people want the flash and the pizzazz. Okay. And they want to try to make predictions when they have no, including myself. I was that way. I lost a lot of time. What I'm trying to get you guys to realize is your most, uh, when it comes to investing, compounding wealth, your biggest asset is time. Nothing happens for the first couple decades. And then the thing starts to go exponential. But if you burn up two decades, trying to time the market, trying to play around on your phone and thinking you're some economic expert that's going to predict the next crash and trading in and out, you're, 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 you're giving up uh, the, the, you're, you're throwing away the most valuable tool that exists, which is that time and that compounding. Okay. Go find us, go collect stamps, go do model railroading, do something else to take your time besides focusing, you know, every minute looking at your phone to see if your stock is going up. You know, I've got people that I've talked about this, uh, that are, uh, friends of mine and you know say hey can you tell me like you know blah 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 this coal stock you were talking about on your video <clears throat> look these are speculations guys i mean do you understand why i'm invested in this company or why i took a position it's a cyclical business it will rise and then it will fall here's the record here's what happens you have to understand that but here's this other company that compounds uh you know, has return on equity 18% or whatever, consistently makes money, has a great little business, takes that the, the profits and cash flows and reinvests in its business because it has the ability to grow and, uh, you know, it compounds over time, but, but it's slow and it's steady and nobody wants that. Like I said, people want that flash. They want that shiny object. All right. So uh, I'm not going to keep repeating myself, but uh, I thought this was interesting. Um, this is something to keep in mind because uh, these big crashes don't happen like you think they do. And like I said, go back to Charlie Munger, what he says, even if you have a 50% uh, fall in the market, which only happens two or three times per century, that's not even, that's, that's more than your lifetime for the most part. So you might see one or two of these things. Um, you should be buying and they always resolve. They, they end up being, nondescript wiggle on a long-term chart. That's what ends up happening. But uh, are you emotionally prepared for that? All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, appreciate you listening. Wanted to get this one in. And so uh, we got it in. Uh, like I said, uh, we'll talk to you next week.